the Bode Museum in Berlin opened in 1904 to originally showcase Renaissance sculpture and painting. It launched the Lab Bode educational initiative to stimulate meaningful interactions and make the museum part of daily life, relating collections to math, movement, reality and gender diversity. So Hans, welcome and thank you that you are able to join us here in this Museum in Context video series to present your book uh, The Changing Social Economy of Art, in which you did a uh, historic analysis on uh, the role of the arts in society from an economic perspective. You'll tell us more about this, but first, could you please tell us something about yourself? Yes, um, I'm Hans Abbing. I'm a trained economist and a trained visual artist. And um, I, yeah, over time I became a uh, professor art, in art sociology and I worked at this department for a very, very long time and I'm quite happy here. Mm -hmm. Great. So in terms of your book, um, you did a historic analysis on how um, the role of the arts has changed in society, also from an economic perspective. Can you perhaps uh, tell us a little bit about this? Yeah. Um, it's a very ambitious book, it's very broad um, and uh, so there are several yeah, uh, tracks in the book but of course an important track is exclusivity and so uh, yeah the answer to the question are the arts becoming less exclusive is of course yes but <laughs> it's becoming less exclusive for yeah maybe a lower middle class but not of course for let little educated people. But that's, uh, and then of course exclusivity play, uh, is important all over the line from very expensive to, to very uh, little expensive. Uh, Coons, yeah? if you can buy one of these um, balloon dogs, of which there are five, you must be extremely um, uh, rich. But yeah, you buy something which is also extremely exclusive. And you don't, and that's the sociology who would say, sociologists who would say that you're not only buying the actual piece of art, you're also buying membership in a very small group, which is attractive and which people are willing to pay for. Exclusivity is also possible because, um, yeah, museums are not always attractive for everybody. And for quite a long time, maybe 100 years, they were very unattractive for a lot of people. Um, less well-educated people, but even yeah, an economic class. Um, it was really for a cultural elite. Art had to be very serious. And that is a track in the book. Um, there has been a period in which art was very serious from the end of the uh, 19th century, already a bit earlier, it was starting off. And it lasts to the present day. But uh, I would say already since 1980, um, yeah, there are phenomena which are, make art less serious. It becomes more commercial, which already is a not very serious aspect of art. But also it becomes more informal in the museums and in the concert halls. You know, first uh, art was in pleasure gardens, um, the, the visual art. Yeah? And then it was moved into the museums. But at first it was still a place for yeah, having a good time with your friends, with your colleagues, uh, for the elite. But they would not look very often at the paintings. They would just, yeah, look, uh, walk through the, um, the corridors and have conversations about anything but art, or a little bit. And it's only and they would talk in loud voices, for instance. And it's only later on that, yeah, you get this very um, people uh, talking in soft voices. Everything is directed at the paintings, um, <coughs> and yeah, what people get out of it, we don't know. And it can be nice to focus on a painting and make your own story with the painting, but it's not um, for everybody and all the time. And it's possible that in an other setting, you can still get something out of the paintings and still feel, and feel comfortable also when you're not belonging to a cultural elite or are expert consumers. Um, can you perhaps say something about the role of the government or policy makers um, in this process of perhaps getting the arts more or less exclusive? Uh, particularly in relationship with the museums. Yeah, um, museums were important for states and for governments and um, because they tell about the history of, of a country. Eh? Rembrandt is Dutch, uh, Van Gogh is partly French, as we know, but we managed to uh, get make him Dutch again. 
Um, so, uh, yeah, but it's not for the common people to get into the museum. At the level of the central government, there has been little interest in making museums more attractive for larger groups. Um, and some actions, they are little aware of it, are contraproductive, I would say. Like governments help museums buy extremely expensive uh, works of art. Uh, Rembrandt's, which cost 80 million earlier, there was Mondrian, and they keep it a little bit hidden for the audience, the public at large, because it's, they, it, I'm afraid that they don't agree. So it's in the back rooms that they decide, oh yeah, we can spend so much money on this wonderful painting. But of course, yeah, Rembrandt reconstructed his greatness, but is he much and much better than some people a bit lower? Uh, or David Hockney recently. Um, and then what I don't like, there is already a winner-take-all mechanism among buyers, yeah? uh, and especially these moguls who are willing to pay huge amounts. And governments actually stimulate this system of uh, winner-take-all central governments, yeah? um, because they even drive up prices even more to keep the painting in the Netherlands or whatever. <coughs> and um, yeah, so I don't like uh, governments supporting what the people who are already very rich or uh, making paintings even more rich, more expensive, which of course, yeah, limits the possibility of museums to, uh, yeah, give uh, access or buy stuff which is slightly less expensive or much less expensive. You could do a lot with 80 million, can't you? So, um, no, I'm not, local governments are different, different I'm quite sure. Uh, but it's most noticeable in the performing arts that local governments behave differently, as far as I know. Can you tell us something about the role of new technologies, uh, the digital museum? Yeah, I think as everybody knows at the moment, uh, the digital uh, possibilities and social media um, are a huge chance on the one hand, but there is also dangerous as aspects. But let's keep to the chances it offers. Um, yes. Of course, reproductions always were um, more accessible for common people, and they did buy posters of the sunflowers of Van Gogh, but we looked down on it. And that's no longer possible, especially not since museums themselves are engaged in offering yeah, what you could call technical reproductions, and now they are on social media and everybody is involved. I can put sunflowers on, on the social media or I can manipulate them and make a new little uh, work of art. And many people do, maybe not in the case of sunflowers. And museums don't mind so much anymore. I have the idea they even may like it. So there's much more freedom in making your own yeah, version and getting involved in a work of art. So that's new technologies and I like it, yeah because you can still have an intense relationship with the work of art. Certainly when you're going to manipulate it, you must have an intense relationship. In the buildings itself, there is of course also a lot of new technology, as you probably know, <laughs> well, certainly know. Um, and yeah, there are Van Gogh exhibitions, which are not in the Van Gogh Museum, but I'm sure supported by the Van Gogh, uh, the, yeah, the Van Gogh Museum, which are, yeah, you don't see any real painting of Van Gogh, it's all, yeah, immersive, you, they offer an immersive experience. You're walking through, you're walking on top of the sunflowers or whatever. And is that bad? No, I don't think so. It's uh, um, the only thing I could have a problem with, it could be imposing again. You know, the old situation was imposing for certain groups of people who didn't feel comfortable and were actually not able to relate to the works of art. Now they are able to relate to this, um, yeah, what's offered to them and they enjoy it and it's entertainment and they get something out of it. But yeah, they are guided by the new curators to take a certain track. Um, maybe on the, uh, on the social media, there's more freedom than in these new, uh, um, yeah, ways of presenting art in an entertaining uh, way, which is, can be quite imposing, I think, but we'll have to wait huh, how this further develops. Um, yeah, I'm just now I'm happy with all experimentation to be, 
to be honest. You know, it's so good that museums have become user-oriented far more than they were in the past. They are, of course, the first. Eh? The performing arts are still dragging behind very much. In the process of that becoming less exclusive, um, do you see a change in diversity of the arts being uh, actually available for consumption? Yes, I see that and I would like to see it even more. Um, it can be done in many ways. There are still museums, sometimes private museums, which are, you may even ask permission to visit the collection. Um, there, are, there are certain days you can get, go there and it's really yeah, intended for um, either expert consumers or people who are willing to go into yeah, a very concentrated way of appreciating the works. So those are separate museums and, and they, you, you have a choice. You can go to that, that museum, but you can also go to a more entertaining museum. Um, and that's good, um, I would say. Um, depends again on the cost. If all, expense, uh, all expenditure or guest subsidies would go to these exclusive museums, I wouldn't be less happy. But there are private people who are willing to spend and sponsor. So do you think by having more diversity of the arts, uh, you will get a greater popularity? Uh, let's think of a sort of a um, not so well-known artist who gets a feature in a museum. So you have a, um, less of an exclusive art uh, uh, being exhibited. Um, will that lower the value of the arts? Of of the museum? Um, well, not in the sense, not in an economic sense, because they, uh, people are willing to pay for the new, uh, even more probably sometimes the museums f felt forced to go into a direc direction like that because their demands was going down and now they can raise up their demands. So it's not in a financial sense, but um, yeah, if it goes down, it's hard to predict. Um, <coughs> I don't know. It's. Uh, you know, when you all the time talking about quality and say uh, David Hockney is, is no is much better than the one's person on below below him, yeah, then then you're in the you you, you you all the time talk about quality, and of course then you will say this devalues art, but then you should be aware that your own way of looking is also very strange. Why should David Hockney be so much more expensive? Then that of it. So quality is a very relative concept. But if people would say, yeah, this devalues art, I don't care so much. As long as there are discussions about qualities, they're not so much the quality, but qualities. Yeah, we, we should carry on uh, having discussions about qualities. Um, and not qualities of people. It would be stupid if you would say, like in the old days, the Monday evening is for school kids only or for low educated people only, then you again put them in a, a box. No, we should be feel, everybody should feel, feel free to be there. Is this a cyclical process that you have observed that they have become less and then more and then less exclusive again? No, uh, I think the, the attitude of the governments are uh, circular or at least going in waves. Uh, in the attention for um, and sometimes the money for making art less exclusive. So in practice it often makes the arts more exclusive, as I explained earlier, but that is not the official policy. Yeah? The po official policy is often to make it more inclusive and that starts with yeah, people like Morris and Ruskin so a long time ago. Um, uh, but that was still paternalistic. Um, the art, yeah, the, the art of the elite had to become interesting for other groups. And we have a repetition of that in the 60s uh, of the last century, 60s, 70s. There is a new wave in which also the governments are yeah, believing in dis uh, dissemination was the word at that time. We have to disseminate art among other groups, social groups, and that didn't work out. And even the fact that it didn't work out was uh, yeah, proving for some social groups, elites, yeah, well, art is not for common people. Um, and then there was an other wave, I think, at the end of the 20th century of um, yeah, welfare. Art was good for welfare. Um, and that was a wave. And now there's a new uh, 
yeah, enthusiasm by especially local governments and the word is inclusion. So yeah, who is inclusion uh, included? Shouldn't there be more respect for the art of other social groups? But then I'm thinking of hip hop and that sort of thing, maybe not so much about, well, kinds of graffiti. Uh, without it being appropriated, in that sense shared, but also taken away. Um, but I think I'm happy with the local governments being interested in inclusion, but it's a bit predictable that it will be a temporary uh, yeah, policy. Yeah, and then later on quality becomes more, more and more important again. Also at this moment, eh? well, yes, we can subsidize, subsidize these, these activities, but quality has to be high. So that limits, uh, and that's the quality as judged by yeah, the art rules. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you very much for joining here to take the time to present some of the main ideas that you have been working with in the last few years um, and culminated in this book. So thank you again. And thank you. It was a pleasure.